We'll call the uh, April 8th Public Safety and Transportation Committee meeting to order. Be looking for a motion to approve today's agenda. So moved. Moved by Duckham, supported by Williams. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item three, public comment. Is there any public comment? Any public comment? Last opportunity for public comment. Seeing none, public comment is now closed. Takes us to item 4A, minutes. I'd be looking for a motion to approve last month's me meeting minutes. So moved. Support. Moved by Bear, supported by Duckham. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item B, appointments. We have a few today. The first is the Community Corrective Corrections Advisory Board, Public Defender. The current member is Harold Downer Jr. The applicant is Christine Beecher. Any information on Christine Beecher? I mean, is she qualified even? I'll refer that to Deborah. Um, the Community Corrections Advisory Board is specific seats, so you have to have a posi particular position um, in order to hold that. And Christine, um, this position is a public defender seat. And she is? She is. Okay. So you have to be a public defender to, to, to be in I this seat. I wondered if she was. I'll, yep. I'll nominate her. Okay, we have Christine Beecher nominated. Are there any other nominations? If none, I'd be looking... I'll take a vote. All in favor of Mrs. Beecher being the recommendation, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Ms. Beecher will be the recommendation. The, the next is the Joint Airport Zoning Board. There is the Airport Board appointee. Current member is Tom Davis. There is no applicant. I uh, would encourage reaching out to Mr. Davis to see if he was still interested. Juan? Okay. The next one is one of two members from townships within 10 miles of the airport. The current member is John Warden. The applicant is John Warden. Okay. Is there any other nominations? Yeah, Commissioner Bear. Got a question. Uh, this is for a township official within 10 miles. Um, can you tell me what township John Warden represents? I believe it's Summit. Thank you. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, all in favor of Mr. Warden being the committee recommendation, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Chair. Yes. We can definitely change this if Tom Davis is interested Tuesday night. We can nominate him from the floor. There'll be no committee recommendation because there okay. wasn't an application. Thank then. Thanks. That concludes appointments for this month. Takes us to item C, fiscal year 25 cost analysis from the public defender. Hello, Mr. Fortino. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I have uh, provided a copy of the uh, cost analysis that we've run in uh, cooperation with uh, MIDC. There are some rate increases. There are some rate decreases. Uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, expenses that we're going to experience is uh, we're changing in the process of changing our uh, case tracking system, the one that we've got now is called Defender Data. It's really kind of outdated, it's wonky, it's hard to use. It doesn't transfer information as well as it should and it doesn't give us the reports that we need. And these, this is the function, this is how we make all of our reports to MIDC to remain funded. Uh, so that's a, an expense that you might have noticed. Other than that, I think everything is in line with, uh, with regard to the, what, what we've uh, asked for in the past. Uh, the, of course, inflation has changed a few of the numbers. Um, I'm asking today for this uh, body to 
send this on to the uh, complete board for recommendation for adoption for our budget. We will have a compliance a plan available. Uh, that is due to MIDC uh, no later than, I think, April 21st. So I think if we get this done in time, we can get that compliance plan in, and we won't have any delay in getting the budget through. So I'm asking this, this body to go ahead and pass this on to the, uh, the general board and recommend uh, its acceptance. Okay, Chairman Shotwell has a question. Mr. Fortino, does this new computer system that you're talking about installing match up well with our systems and everything within circuit and district court, or are we going to be doing something that is well, dis it's, it's, dis it's, disadvantageous to us? It's designed to do that, as I understand it. I'm not real technical, but I've been told by uh, one of my uh, attorneys who is he's, he's very into this type of technology, and he's been working with MIDC, and they say that it does match up with most systems. More importantly, it will link us a lot better, give us a much better link with the police agencies and the prosecuting attorney's office because a lot of times there's, it, there are difficulties getting information from the police department to the prosecuting attorney's office to us. So time, sometimes we're waiting for discovery through nobody's real fault uh, up until the date of trial. Uh, it's, uh, I think, mainly the, the, the reporting system, the case tracking system that we have now. I should mention that MIDC is recommending and many of the other offices in the state are going to this new system that we're looking at. So that means there's got to be an IT cost for us to be able to marry up to this system and who's going to pay for all of that? I don't know if that's built into the budget. I'm not even sure what that is. An IT... Go ahead, Deborah. If I can. So we have our local share which um, this year it looks to be 571, 775. Anything over and above that is covered by Public Defender's Office, and that's always how it's been. We have a cost for the current system. I'm not sure what it is, but any differential in the cost would be covered by over and above our local share. Um, and they don't have access to JIS in the court systems because there is confidential information on public records, so they don't have that full access to the court's case management system because of confidential information in there. Can they go on public site and get it? Yeah. So they do have it? Not the, not, not the as an employee. Record. So employees okay. in the court system have access to non-public record information that may be mm -hmm. um, um, a deferment that's dismissed or made non-public and those types of things. So non-public records that are part of the case management system in the courts, the public de public defender doesn't have access to that. Okay, so well, you do, do have access to the public records. I yes. hope everybody, commissioners, there's a private uh, uh, service out there. It's called iChat. You can get a. It's like the. Uh, it's a criminal history, but generally, it's not a complete criminal history, and that's that's our jump off point. So once we get involved in the case and we start getting discovery, then we learn more about our client's criminal history. But uh, it's absolutely correct. We do not have full access to JIS with the courts. Okay, I, I will not support this. Hope everybody realizes anything the public defender gets next month, we'll have the prosecutor in here asking for a countermeasure that will raise our costs of supporting the prosecutor's office. Or he'll need more people, one of the two. So I won't support this for that, that reason. This is just a change in the case management system that they have. There's no ch staffing changes. Just he'll be in here. He'll be in here. I'm just. <laughs> he'll be in here wanting more now. Well, I, I understand that. I, I understand the prosecutor's position, and, and I respect that position. Um, but th these are the numbers that MIDC, MIDC thinks that we need to be able to operate efficiently. I'm, I'm just really surprised you guys don't have a pet dog in your office um, because the prosecutor does. They do? The prosecutor well, I'm got getting his one. pet dog, you don't. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a game of tit for tat, you know? And no, I think uh, driving the cost of legal system up for the taxpayers of Jackson County. My understanding is the reason, one of the reasons they have a dog in their office is it's, uh, it helps with the victim witness coordinating staff. It helps with the, with the victims and the uh, witnesses that they deal with. Uh, I will say that uh, one of my attorneys uh, in the basement at the courthouse does occasionally bring his cat in. All right. If they want a cat, I won't, I won't object. To that. <laughs> Commissioner Bear has a question. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. 
Um, looking at the financial reports from last month, there were quite a few interpreters hired yes. to help clients. Um, can you tell me how many, I'm a, my assumption is those people that needed an interpreter are illegal border crossers. Um, I, I couldn't tell you not that. Not US citizens. Can you tell me, or will you keep the statistics, how many of the people that are you that you are defending are locals, are U.S. citizens, and how many are criminal border crossers? I I, I can't give you that information. I don't know that information. I I, I don't. I, 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 occasionally, please? occasionally we do have uh, persons who are in the country. They're immigrants, or they're here illegally. But it doesn't happen that often, maybe three times a year, four times a year, where we have to send them to a specific attorney who speaks that language. Or there's a, a, a program where you can get an interpreter on, online, so you don't actually have to pay them fees to come into court and, and testify. You could do it all online. So out of the income, a number of people that we represent, <clears throat> I'm going to say 95 to 98% are Jackson County or surrounding counties, we really, I, I haven't seen a, uh, an issue with immigrants, illegal immigrants or otherwise. Okay, thank you for that. Yes. It's kind of off the subject, but you do have it listed here, and that's the uh, assistant public defender wages. Yes. Why is it Kareem Johnson, why is he being paid so much more than the rest. He's chief assistant. He's, he's got administrative duties as well. Well, you're chief assistant. Oh, okay, you're chief. Defender. I'm the chief public defender. He's a chief assistant. Okay, well, thank I, you. I, I should let the, the board know. <clears throat> Kareem did retire last Friday. And not retire, he resigned last Friday. Oh, okay. So we are looking for a new uh, chief assistant. Okay, if there's no more committee member questions I'd be looking for a motion to forward this to the full board with recommendation of approval Mo moved by bear supported by Williams is there any discussion roll call vote please Commissioner bear yes Commissioner walls yes Commissioner Duckham no Commissioner Williams? Yes. Chairman Kennedy? Yes. Pass 4 1. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate Mr. it. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Takes us to item D, District Court semi annual report. And hello, Jeremy. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, before we get into the actual report that I submitted to you, I did want to inform you on Thursday, we, re we received um, a memo from uh, the state court administrator's office regarding um, the the court cost sunset. Um, this has been an ongoing for about 10 years. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that certain court costs were uh, unconstitutional, and since then, legislative um, packages have been essentially kicking the can down the road. It is scheduled to sunset, expire, May 1st of this year, um, rendering all court costs that are assessed by the, by the judges um, illegal for us to be able to um, assess that. Uh, Representative Leitner has submitted a package of bills beginning of January, middle of January, I believe, um, but they are not anticipating that that will get um, passed or um, signed prior to the May 1 um, uh, deadline. This happened once, I guess, probably about two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, where there was about a four or six week window in which um, it had expired again. And during that time, the courts were unable to assess the court costs. What those are, are the cost of the, um, the process of the court piece, the indirect costs that occur from um, uh, HR, IT, county administration of, of what um, 
occurs and supports for the court, plus then personnel operations within. That is roughly an average of about $75,000 a month that um, is, is collected by the courts. Just giving you that heads up, this is outside of the control of this court. Um, this will affect both uh, district and circuit. Um, but I wanted to give you that heads up um, of that memo that we received on Thursday. What's this showing? Beckham. What kind of effect will this have on the county budget? Well, right now, about seventy-five thousand dollars a month. Um, seventy-five a month. Yep, yeah. that's that our that average covered, yeah? of collection. Deb. Do we have a way to cover this new cost incurred by the county? Um, no, we don't have a way to cover the gap. I mean, not at this point. We'd have to pull from the general fund. We're talking about 900000 a year. Yeah, I would anticipate um, Representative Leitner has been yeah. a strong advocate. And as she's Jeremy actively working on she's, this. She's heavily working on this. Um, I think the problem is that they tie barred her bill to a different bill. Mm -hmm. And that slowed down the movement because typically this has been done. What is this the third time they've yeah. had to extend the sunset? And this has been a bipartisan yeah. issue. Um, it's just that this additional add-on of of trying to trying to solve it. This tie bar is trying to solve the problem, not just kicking it down the road again. But Representative Leitner is like, we have to solve this mm -hmm. right now for May first. Well, I'm I'm just concerned because the justice system. And all the liberal states seem to have been defanged, and they're just ineffective. They let the criminals back on the street, and we all see the news. So this um, this just has to do with the funding, and as Jeremy indicated, the ability to assess fines. Um, this has been this is like the third or fourth time they've had to extend the sunset. This dates back over twelve or thirteen yeah. years ago when the Cunningham um, ruling came down from the Supreme Court. So they keep extending it and haven't resolved the court funding issue that they've done studies on, gosh, five or six years ago before yeah. COVID. Yeah. And, um, and so what they tie barred Sarah's bill to, I'm sorry, Representative Leitner's bill to, is they tie barred it to a proposed resolution, um, a study um, that they will do for staffing and funding for the courts. So they tie barred Sarah's extension of the fees that are sunsetting May 1st and then they tie barred it to this proposed resolution and that's what's holding it up I think yeah. is um, tie barring it otherwise because this has happened three times before yeah yeah and they've uh, sailed through and right. not been a problem and they've renewed the funding right but it's so, the problem is they do it for two years right so then every two years they got to keep renewing the sunset I do not anticipate this being a long, long haul. It might be four weeks. It might be six weeks. It will be some haul. I do not anticipate because we're not the only county. We're not the only court. Um, there, this is, this is an issue for the entire state yes, and the representative, sir, and, and the, they they understand that. There will be no way to recoup our lost no fines. No. Okay. So six weeks, we lose $100,000. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, so, okay, so that's that part. Um, you have my annual report. Um, there's a couple things I just want to touch base on, and then, of course, if there's any other questions. Um, I'm, su I'm assuming you've taken the time to go over this amazing report that we've prepared for you. Uh, so just wanted to point out on page four, um, there was overall the total filings from year over year, um, a reduction of 314 filings. Those are in our traffic citations, our tickets. Um, you'll see that our felony, our civil, as well as our overall misdemeanor cases have risen quite a bit um, over the course of, of that um, over last year. Uh, our tickets, on average, are a very low um, percentage of our time. The other cases, those are much more time sensitive, or not time sensitive, but time, um, uh, 
on task, if you will, with those cases that we've had the increase over the year. Um, the other is on page um, 14, uh, the civil division. I've talked to you quite a bit for our my file, um, and that has been implemented. We are still working out some of the, the kinks that have come with that new system. Um, we have found that our court has been using it um, pretty inten intensely with it. Um, some of the other courts, when they've had some issues, they've just kind of done workarounds. So we have been working very closely with the uh, state court um, and the JIS uh, programmers on doing some modifications with that. Um, we've been, uh, they've had us do some additional testing and piloting on some other issues. And we've gotten several compliments from the state on, on how our civil department really has taken uh, the ownership as well as challenged them with some of the stuff with this, with the my file system with this. So um, I'm very proud of the team that they have done with that. It has not, surprise, not been everything that it's been promised to us. So we are working to try to get that um, up and running. This is a state funded program. This was um, implement, being implemented throughout, sorry, throughout the entire state, we were in wave three of this implementation. Those are the two main highlights I wanted to point out. Um, are there any questions? Committee members, any questions? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to receive the report. Support. Moved by Bear, supported by Williams. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Thanks. Have a great day, Jeremy. Yes, Takes us to item E, Circuit Family Probate Courts Annual Statistics. Charles is here. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Chairman. Kennedy, how was everyone today? Looks like we're going to have 70 degrees and uh, uh, craziness with the uh, lunar eclipse or solar eclipse. I haven't kept up with that too much. Um, where our overall numbers are just about back to pre-COVID levels, which we anticipated they would be. Um, generally, we've been busy. We have had numerous relatively high profile uh, jury trials. Um, you know, we're trying to catch up on the civil docket too. Um, Judge Wilson has a current uh, civil trial jury trial that's starting today um, between just coming off the full moon mercury and retrograde and our um, uh, eclipse coming it has been pretty crazy pretty busy um, but everything generally is going okay we um, recently lost our juvenile referee um, and we're currently advertising right now for a new one. Uh, decided to go into private practice here in Jackson with one of our resident uh, law firms. And so we're very happy for her, but it was a big loss for us. Because you don't find one of those just standing on the street corner. Um, other than that, I'll take any questions anyone has. Committee members, any questions? Commissioner Duckham. Yes, how, uh, the backlog in trials, are we overcome that we still have a backlog but we're I would say about a year out yet um, but so many you know take pleas and things like that um, but we we still have a backlog compared to where we were but we're mm -hmm. much closer than we were a year ago this time next year we should be right on course I think yeah, that uh, we man, will yeah. be almost caught up next year thank you sir you're welcome any other questions? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to receive the report. So moved. moved by Williams, supported by Bear. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Thanks. Have a great day, Charles. Thank you, Ken. Of course. Uh, item F, Airport Consumers Energy Easement. Juan is here. Good morning, Juan. Good morning, Chairman Kennedy. I've got uh, two easement requests. The first one is for an update to the... Uh, electric line power poles 
on the intersection of uh, Wildwood Avenue and Michigan Ave. And this is a uh, no cost to the airport or the county. And it will be uh, uh, granting an easement to Consumers Energy for this particular easement. Committee members, are there any questions? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to forward to the full board with recommendation of approval. Move support. Move by Bear, supported by Duckham. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item G, Blackman Charter Township water main easement. This is a, associated with the ARPA project that's updating the water main at the airport. And this requires the uh, county to give an easement to to Blackman Charter Township so they can uh, maintain and repair the uh, water mains when that needs to be done. This, this once again, is a uh, no cost to the county. Commissioner Duckham. Is this the one the drain commissioners had issues with? Uh, not, not, the particul not this particular part of the project. He's having issues with the uh, detention ponds, which is part of the uh, storm drain update. Okay, are, are you working through that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bear. Thank you, Committee Chair. This easement requires uh, earthwork. Uh, so you have you yet obtained the soil erosion sedimentation control permit for this work? Yes, uh, we are in the process of obtaining that. And uh, the project itself has been put out to the contractor Bailey excavating and they're, they're expected to start this here in the next month or so. So everything's moving along with that. And the erosion control is, there's two parts to this project. There's the water main project and there's the uh, detention pond and storm drain part of the project. And so that's what we're working out to get the correct uh, or all the appropriate permits from the uh, Blackman Charter Township and we're working with the drain commissioner on that. But this particular uh, Eastman permit has already been issued. You said you were working with the drain commissioner on the SESC permits? Those are issued by the Jackson County Department of Transportation. Right, not so. By the drain commissioner. Right, so that permit has been issued, and that's uh, for the water main part of the project. There's other permits that are required for this project that we're working with with the drain commissioner. The drain commissioner has not given approval and therefore Blackman Charter Township has not given approval for the rest of the project. This easement is for the water main, so for this particular part of the project, we do have the permit, the, the Eagle you. permit. Thank you. Any other committee member questions? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to forward to the full board with recommendation of approval. So moved. Moved by Duckham, supported by Walls. Is there any discussion? If not, if you'd post the vote, please. It's been posted. I don't have it. Do you have it yes, now? I'm a yes, but I don't I'll have just give, give the signal there to the clerk. Okay. Okay. That's unanimous. All right. Passes unanimously. Takes us to item H. Thank you, Juan. Have a great day. Takes us to item H, Jackson County Department of Transportation, Asphalt Emulsion. Morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, uh, first item, the asphalt emulsion, uh, GCD has asked for a one-year contract for a possible one-year extension for uh, materials from Michigan Paving and Materials, K-Track uh, Specialty Coating Zinc and Asphalt Materials uh, to provide the material uh, not to exceed $600,000. Um, this is for 2024 and possibly 2025 construction season. Uh, as a result of the different materials that we were requesting bids for, uh, we're going to be awarding it to each supplier, depending on what that material is. Uh, compared to last year, the prices were only half a percent to one percent more than what we had received from previous years. So uh, we were 
quite happy with what we got for results. Um, a lot of these materials that you see in the report can be used on multiple different construction projects, such as chip seal, fog seal, dura patcher, the tack we put down uh, prior to paving, and the CIR emulsion. And then some of the other materials are secondary materials that we can use if there's an issue with supply at that time. So um, we're asking the board to award to all these suppliers for this year uh, for $600,000, not to exceed. Any questions? Commissioner Baer. Thank you. The request for this year is 600000 Can you tell me what the request was last year for this product? Uh, I, I would imagine it was also 600000 but I can look into it and find out what we requested for the previous year. Okay, did I hear you correctly that you said the costs that were submitted were only one-half of 1%? Yeah, half a percent to 1% for each of the materials. That's very good. Thank you. Any other committee member questions? If not, I'd be looking for a motion to forward to the full board with recommendation of approval. So moved. Support. Moved by Bear, supported by Williams. I'll go ahead and post the vote. It's posted. Adam, yes. Commissioner Duckham is a yes. Thank you. Unanimous. Passes unanimously. Takes us to item I, chip seal stone. All right, uh, so we're asking to provide the chip seal stone to Stone Co. of Michigan and Yellow Rose Transport for one year with the possibility of doing a one-year extension, but not to exceed $250,000 per year. Uh, we did have three vendors that uh, bid on this project, and we are going to go with the lowest bidder. Um, it's typically what we've been doing for previous years for our chip seal program. Committee members, are there any questions? <coughs> Commissioner Duckham. How does this compare to last year? Um, I don't have the numbers for last year, but I can definitely look into that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just was curious if we've used these companies before. Uh, yes, we've used, I think, all of these companies in the past at least once. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank Commissioner you. Bear. I, too, was just going to ask on what was the cost last year to compare to this year. Yep. So I can look into that. I apologize for not bringing that. Just email that to us. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Good enough. I'd be looking for a motion to forward to the full board with recommendation of approval. So moved. moved by Bear, supported by Williams. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously, takes us to item J, gravel mining. All right, so we're looking at doing some gravel mining at the Cochrane Road Gravel Pit in Hanover Township, and we'd like to uh, award that to the Iron River Sand and Gravel with a cost not to exceed 165000 uh, The Cochrane Road Pit has material for uh, 23A gravel, which is typically used on our gravel roads or our shoulder gravel throughout our road network. Um, the last time we have processed any gravel at the Cochran Road gravel pit was back in 2018. So um, the lowest bidder was $6 compared to the highest bidder of almost $12. We have not used this uh, contractor before, but we have called uh, different agencies in the area that may have used them and they had nothing but good good things to say about this contractor getting in doing the work and having uh, all their material passing so um, we're looking to process approximately 25,000 cubic yards and we're going to be doing it in cubic yards versus tons and we're able to use our uh, drone technology to accurately measure those stockpiles so we're paying exactly processed so is my understanding correct that it's our gravel and that we're paying somebody to mine it and process it? Yes. Okay. Is there any other committee member questions? Motion by Duckham. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Pileski. I didn't see you. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And thanks for the courtesy. This is my, my district. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'm sure someone will ask me this very question. So the question is, what effect will um, the transportation of the product in and out 
of the pit due to local roads, which are looked upon as being in pretty terrible shape out in that area. Are you asking about the wear and tear on the ground, the road accessing Cochrane? That, that's exactly the question. I'm sure I'll be asked multiple times. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, that, that pit's been there for many, many years, and uh, we've coordinated with the township every time we've had processing at this pit, uh, making sure if there's any permits and if there's any concerns that need to be addressed. So we tried to work very closely with the township in preparation for any mining activities out there. But we don't. But ultimately, this is our road. Yes. Okay. Right. So, do we look upon? We. I suppose what you're telling me is we don't look upon this activity as being incrementally worse than what normally goes on. Correct. But that's bad enough, I guess. <laughs> that in the view of those who asked me multiple times. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have a motion on the floor from Duckham. Do we have support? Support from Walls, is there any discussion? If not, I'd have you post a vote, please, sir. It's been posted. Passes unanimous. Thank you. Takes us to item K, sodium chloride. All right, uh, so we're uh, bringing forth to the approval for the uh, award of the sodium chloride contract to Detroit Salt at a cost not to exceed $2.2 million per year. Um, we did send this out as a combined bid with Calhoun County. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, several years now uh, and get, been getting favorable prices. The increase that we received was about $2.34 uh, per ton. And last year for the winter of 2023 and 2024, we ended up only spending about $850,000 because of the mild winter that we had. But for budgetary reasons, we always plan about $2.2 million in case we get a worst case scenario winter storm. So uh, we're asking to award this to the Detroit Salt at a cost not to exceed $2.2 million for next winter. Committee members, are there any questions? Make a motion to approve. Motion by Duckham. Support. Supported by Bear. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item L, resolution number 04-24.08, local bridge program. So we're asking for a resolution to approve the application of the bridges that we're applying for for fiscal year 2027. Um, that is a grant program that MDOT's been sending out for a call of projects uh, every year. So we have uh, combined a several bridges that we found that should have some sort of fix as either a replacement, rehabilitation, or preventative maintenance. So. We work with our team and closely with the engineering firm that does the yearly inspections, Great Lakes, and they give us the recommendations on what bridges we should chase after, uh, depending on the points that each bridge could score. So the bridges that we are applying for this year is to replace the Ben Road Bridge over the Sandstone Creek, to rehabilitate the Springport Road Bridge uh, over at Minard Park, it would be the, the easternmost bridge at that location. Replace the bridge at Palmer and Wolf Lake Road over the Raisin River. And then we have listed five preventative maintenance projects for bridges. Usually we can, we can package up to five bridges uh, and try to have them as a similar fix. So these are all going to be an epoxy overlay over the structure. So um, in item E, you can see all the different projects that we already have current for bridges in the county that have funding that we are working on throughout either the design process, closing out the construction, or putting, to propose, putting together proposals for the, for the following year. So um, there is no financial commitment at this time. This is just uh, uh, applying for the projects. If they were to be awarded, we would be committed to a 5% match, which is typical. Commissioner Duckham. Is there any idea what the timeline of obtaining the funding here? Uh, usually 
we find out what bridges are going to be awarded in a few months after we apply for it, but these wouldn't be uh, able to be constructed until 2027. That's, that's what I thought a couple years down the road. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee member questions? Make yep. a motion we approve. Moved by Duckham, supported by Williams. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item M, resolution number 04-24.10, Brooklyn Safe Routes to School. All right, uh, so we're looking at getting a resolution uh, signed from our board as per request of our application for the Safe Routes to School program. We've been working with Columbia Schools, uh, Brooklyn, the Village of Brooklyn, uh, on the pathway that would connect the, the schools along Turk Road and uh, Cement City Road and Tiffany Road into the village. So this would be uh, constructing a 10-foot ten, ten bike path. So over the last uh, couple, several months, we've been working with the school on any responsibilities that the Act 51 agency is required to participate in as part of this application. So as part of this application, there's a resolution that needs to be approved by our board. And in item B of this report, it has the listed bullet points that is spelled out in, in the application that must be included in the resolution. Um, the Village of Brooklyn has already done a resolution claiming the ownership and, and uh, financial responsibility of the project. And uh, Columbia Schools has also provided a letter of support saying that they would take ownership and financial responsibility of it. And they will also be passing a resolution this afternoon, actually, for the full commitment. So there will be no financial responsibility at this time. If the project is awarded, JCDOT will still continue working with the school and the village on a cost that would be directly charged to them. And we would just be a participating a player at the table so committee members any questions if not i'll be looking for a motion to forward to the full board so moved moved by bear support supported by duckham any discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. all opposed passes unanimously takes us to the monthly report all right uh so our first project that we have is the tree work grant projects. So we have the Deering and Jefferson Road. Those, pro those two roads, we've actually got all the tree removal completed on that project last month, and we are just now starting to do the uh, sign signage and pavement markings. We've been working very closely with MDOT on Deering Road since this, this roadway actually intersects the project that they're doing with the roundabouts at 94 and, and Deering Road. So we've been working with them quite closely. Uh, Springport and Minard Road, we got those trees all removed last, last month. So that is all prepared and ready for a contractor to start construction. Uh, we've been coordinating with them and they are planning to start construction uh, April 22nd. So we're gonna have message boards uh, and door hangers taken out the, early this week to notify the residents. We have reached out to the township as well to make the township aware that the project is is commencing away. Um, and then we also have been doing the non-motorized bike path for uh, this, uh, the county parks for the Michael Levine Trail. So um, we've got the trees and brush removed on that project, and we are going to be switching over to doing the concrete removal. There's some debris out there that a consumer is requesting that we remove as part of the project. Commissioner Bear. Thank you. Um, your tree work, all the roads, you, yeah, you, you've been doing a lot of tree work all around the county. A year or two years ago, what people were asked to submit um, the names of roads that were beautiful trails that we could send people out, drive certain roads, and you see some of the most beautiful landscape in the county. Well, part of what makes these roads beautiful is the trees. I know you cut down the trees to have the sun shine on the asphalt and dry it out. How do you get a balance between cut down trees to save, to theoretically These, prevent the, the asphalt, and cut down trees and you no longer have beautiful roads? Yeah. 
So these specific projects are projects that we applied for, uh, for safety grants. So these specific roads had some sort of crash that resulted in either an injury or a fatality. So our agency chased after getting grant money for these projects, thinking that the, the value of human life is more valuable than the trees that could be potentially hazardous to the motoring public. So, you're so that's, our, that's our balancing act is based off so of crash data. So you are removing trees that somebody has crashed their car into? Uh, not the specific tree. We'll do, we'll do a, a range of trees off the edge of the pavement. So we'll typically go out there and say all the trees within 12 foot off of the edge of the pavement uh, will be removed. So that gives them the ability to recover if they go off the roadway that they can get back onto the roadway without hitting a fixed object. So. I mean, safety is our highest priority for our agency. So any anytime we get re any information that one of our corridors is uh, not safe for the motoring public, we try to see what we can do to address those safety concerns. So you've got a 12-foot standard for getting trees away from the roadway? That's typically what we chase after, yes, for the safety grant projects. Okay, then the roads I typically drive in the county you're going to be taking down hundreds in, in, in a lot of 50 year old oak trees that are in a lot of projects like our regravel projects we only clear trees within six feet of the edge of the roadway just because of what the the contours look like out there so if the contour of the roadway goes up we don't necessarily have to clear as many trees as if the contour drops drops off significantly so it's it's also a case by case uh, basis but when we do safety projects we have to sit by a specific guideline that's uh, given by MDOT for our clear zone distances all right thanks for that some of that's disappointing <laughs> it's it's hard when you're doing that balancing act trying to Okay, sorry about that. Um, Blackman Township. So completed manholes and valve adjustments. Those were to adjust all the manholes and valves that were completed on the roads for last year. And we also last month have been doing the tree trimming, uh, debris removing on the roadsides and cross culvert replacements on all of the roads that we are uh, prepar preparing to do uh, this, this year in Blackman Township. So a few of these pictures are from Last, uh, last month's uh, progress. For maintenance, for patching, uh, we have a table right here showing the different quantities of material that we have used throughout the county. So we placed about 189 tons of cold patch, about 100 tons of reclaimed HMA, and about 250 gallons of Durapatcher. So um, due to the, the mild winter that we had, it gave our, our uh, agency a quicker response time to address potholes than we have in previous years. So we are able to work on that. Cross culvert replacements, we've been just working around the county, replacing any cross tubes that needed to be replaced just based on either whether they fully failed or if they're deteriorating to the point where they're about to collapse. And then throughout the county, we have been working on ditching on any drainage requests that we receive to our office along with dirt deberming along gravel roads and also grading gravel roads around the county as well. Any questions on the report? Committee members, are there any questions? Commissioner Duckham. Not a question, but it, I'd like to thank you for a nice, precise, quick report. You did a nice job. Thanks. I have a quick question. If you prefer, you can email it to me. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I have had some people in townships ask, um, since their secondary road is in such bad shape, it's almost beyond patching can even do anything. The township has made it clear, at least this one particular one, that they're not going to put any funds towards uh, the county match program. If, if there's a process for the citizens to turn these tore up paved roads back into a gravel road, and if there is, how they would petition to do so. Um, I haven't been a part of a situation like that, but I know in Calhoun they've looked at that process of crushing up some of their paved local roads into gravel roads, but I can definitely look into that and then provide you some feedback on that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Is there any other committee member questions or comments? If not, I'll be looking for a motion to receive the report. Moved by Bayer. Supported by Duckham. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item O, resolution to, it's a correction of a previous resolution we did for the Sandhill Drive private to public road acceptance. Yes, yeah, so this uh, resolution is specifically to change the Sand Hill Estate um, private road that was added to our network. The uh, original date to add it to our network was January 1st of 2024. Um, what we would like to change it to December 31st of 2020, should say 2023, sorry. Um, but the, the main reason for this is when we provided the cert book to MDOT to certify our new roads, they saw that the resolution approved the road to be added to our network in the beginning of 2024 when the cert book was actually for 2023. So there was a there was a contradict between the two. So to correct that, if we switch it to December 31st, we'll be able to collect MTF funds for last year in 2023. If we don't make any corrections, we just won't collect any funding for that project until the following physical year. Um, that's basically. Commissioner Bear. Thank you. John, I got a question. It says that the, uh, we have to provide an acknowledgement that the road has been accepted into the county road system prior to December 31st. And you're asking that it be effective December 31st. Well, to me, prior to December 31st is not December 31st. It's December 30th. Yeah, I know we're, we're not eligible for these funds currently because we are off by one day. I don't want to be back in that same situation again. Do you are you then? Con is December 31st the right date? Yeah, December 31st is the right date. I was going back and forth between December 31st and January 1st, going back and forth that while putting this report together. So I apologize for the confusion, but we did reach out to MDOT and they said if the resolution is adjusted to say December 31st, then that resolution can be uploaded to MDOT and they can make that correction on their end. So okay. yes, the December Thank 31st you. is the correct date. Any other questions, committee members? Because we did in fact pass it in uh, December, correct? The board? The board yeah, you, you passed it in December That's to take I effect thought. in, in okay. January. Be looking for a motion to forward this to the full board with recommendation of approval. So moved. Moved. Moved by Walls, supported by Duckham. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Resolution number 4-24.09, Police Week. Um, there's no one here to present it. It's basically just supporting our local law enforcement agency we did something similar last year hopefully you all got a chance to take a look at the resolution i'm sure my fellow commissioners all support our police but if there's any comments or discussion feel make free a motion we approve one second commissioner duncan commissioner bear i would like to move approval of this resolution commissioner duncan had the motion so we'll give you the support um any discussion all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item Q, the automated license plate reader proposed policy. I do not see a representative from sheriff here today. So um, I'm gonna let Deborah take the mic. Thank you very much. Um, this policy is um, the same content. Um, there are some red lines there, as I explained at study session last week. Um, I met with the sheriff and two of his command staff on Wednesday afternoon. Um, in addition, we received back from, I had sent it previously to our attorney, and um, so there are a few changes from our attorney, but um, in meeting with the sheriff and two of his command staff, the policy, if I can speak on his behalf since I don't see anyone, um, the policy was acceptable to them with the changes that we discussed. I incorporated all the changes after our meeting on Wednesday. Um, and so these changes reflect 
changes requested by the sheriff's office and requested by our attorney. Committee members, Commissioner Duckham. Yes, uh, going to item 419.56, prohibited uses. We have number seven, the paragraph after number seven. It says anyone who engages in impermissible use of the ALPR system or associated scan files or hot lists may be subject to criminal prosecution. I understand that. Civil liability, I understand that. Administrative sanctions pursuant to and consistent with collective bargaining agreements. Uh, it, rather than that part, the last one, uh, after civil liability, I, I think it should be termination of employment. Uh, if you say may, I mean, ask a kid, you, you, can you, may I do this? And they're going to keep asking and keep asking because there's not a clear definition. When you say no, there is. And if you're serious about keeping this flock system camera from being misused, there should be a definite end game. And that's, yes, you will be subject to prosecution. Yes, you will be civil, you'll be pro, uh, subject to civil liability and administrative sanctions, but you'll do it on your own dime because you're terminated. I agree. That, that's much more effective. There's a definite, definite penalty for misusing this, not arguing and say, oh, I didn't know. And you know, well, if you know you're gonna be terminated, you're gonna get the answers before you, you do it. And I, I think it's too weak. So, I like uh, termination to be the final. So I had similar concerns last week in the study session. Not exactly the same thing, but I definitely wanted uh, a firmer definition of what would happen to an individual if they were to violate it. This seems to me to be wishy-washy. The sheriff's response was, um, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but if I remember correctly, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if the other committee members was, he felt that there should be a different standard for someone that intentionally violated the policy compared to if someone accidentally did something. That was basically the gist of what I got from him as to why the word may should be in there instead of shall and not an indefinite termination. I tend to agree with you, Commissioner Duckham, but I'm just um, may, putting may. that out there because I know there was technical difficulties and that couldn't be viewed on uh, YouTube last week. Well, you get caught using, you say, oh, I didn't mean to, or I didn't know. Well, it's up to the sheriff to teach, teach and be firm with what's expected here, not let them all come up with their own uh, description of what I didn't know or I didn't mean to is, is about. They, everybody understands termination. And uh, we went ahead and supported this. Unfortunately, I think now we need to firm up the uh, abuses and make sure that they're clear and consistent and will be terminated is pretty consistent and pretty clear. So are you looking for language yes. at the end that says up to and including termination? Is that what you're I think it should say termination or termination second offense. You know, I mean, it needs to be firm. So that's where we have to be consistent with a collective bargaining agreement. And I'm not arguing either way, right. um, but we just have to, we have to follow the laws and the collective bargaining agreement says you have to have um, progressive discipline based on the severity of, um, of the violation of the, or the infraction. So if you have a minor violation, we can't fire the person. That's gonna cost us a lot of money. So I think that's part of the reason as well that the sheriff was looking for flexibility in here is because you have to determine what the person did, which may be less severe than something somebody else did. And so you have to have that flexibility of what they did to violate it and so that's where the collective bargaining agreement comes in. Flexibility is what got us into this whole shebang, got blindsided anyhow. Policy didn't seem to matter when it comes to signing a contract that wasn't, you didn't have the authorized pay grade to sign. And it's just, so well, let we, me... we, we violated the constitution there in my book, but if we continue to allow 
a misuse of this, we're violating more constitutional rights, and that shouldn't happen. So I'm just going to give an example based on my conversation on Wednesday with the sheriff. So, for example, in the policy here, it says that other law enforcement agencies that we don't have a mutual aid agreement with have to have, have to write, put in writing their request to have access to our information. Um, so say the person doesn't get that in writing, um, and they just take a phone call from Toledo Police Department that says, hey, we want this information, and the person says, oh, okay, here you go, we'll give it to you. They, ver they verify. Per permission so they should, violated the policy. Permission should be in writing. Right. Right text is writing. But they violate the policy because they didn't put, have it in writing from Toledo Police Department. We Are we going to fire that person for not putting something in writing versus another person who may be running their girlfriend's plate? Well, that's the that's the that's the difference in the Toledo, severity. If Toledo and, calls and wants information, they misuse it. We don't share it with them anymore because they're not following our constitution. We in Jackson should live by our constitution. So that's why I'm trying to, because there is a severity of a violation of this policy, and that's why there needs to be some flexibility because. In my example, are we going to fire the person that didn't put something in writing, which isn't as severe to me in my mind, as someone who then uses the system to follow their girlfriend or something, but or significant the, other. The so, sheriff said policies and procedures will protect the privacy. Yes. He, I think in writing, it's easy enough. I mean, a phone call, send me a text message, we'll send it your way. Now, if they misuse it, then it should come off, they should be scratched off our list of sharing information with. Oops, absolutely. Um, so I, if, if that's how, if you want it to be everyone is fired for no matter what they do. Well, it's pretty clear. That, that that's what it says. They would be terminated no matter what. No matter what they do, not following this policy. I could probably live with second, second misuse, terminated, but it needs to be in there because it is get a lot more attention than maybe terminated or maybe reprimanded. Okay, Commissioner Williams has some input and then we'll come back to you. Is that okay, okay Commissioner yeah. Duckham? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, uh, I'll be brief here. Um, I do agree with uh, Commissioner Duckham that I, I would like to see stronger language there, but the, your, uh, Deborah, your last comments there um, do kind of give me some, some light um, of, of, of some better understanding in that regard, but is there any way that we can incorporate um, language in there that would um, specifically state if someone were to um, misuse the system on their own will? So not like a supervisor or Toledo called, but they decided and said, or within themselves, I'm going to figure out where person X is today. Is there any way we can incorporate that type of language where that scenario would be a complete termination? Yes, I can wordsmith and put um, something to the effect of misuse of the system as opposed to any mistake, you know, or because um, to me, I'm not looking to terminate somebody because they didn't get something in writing from Toledo Police Department or wherever it might be. Mm -hmm. Something, I'm just making that minor infraction up, but it would still be a violation of this policy. Mm -hmm. So I could wordsmith and put something to the effect of more serious violations, you know, could up to including a termination or something like that. Okay, thank so you. So we can wordsmith that. That, that would be good. I'd, I'd be happy with that. And then is there also, uh, my last question, Mr. Chair, if that's okay, um, is there also a way that we could put in, um, I don't know if it would be more of like a procedure where they, the person who's using the system has an authorized list of users prior to? Like, I don't know how soon, like that, um, someone who I guess would apply to, to have that information so that we can legally give that to them. I'm not sure how that works, but is there a consistent list that they could have like next to a computer or something that shows Toledo didn't went the right way, Ohio, whoever, you know, does that make sense? So from my understanding is any <coughs> law enforcement agency can request information from us mm -hmm. 
and vice versa. So like if we're looking for a car or a missing person, we can request access from other. From the way that it was explained to me Wednesday afternoon at my meeting with the sheriff and his two command staff is it will, like if you're looking for a missing person, it will it will show, it won't tell you everything up front, but it will say that there's a hit on this plate in Texas. So then in Austin, Texas. So then if, if it's us that's looking for that person, we would have to contact Austin, Texas and say, hey, the system told us we have a hit on your, in your area. Could you please look, could we please have access? And then they would grant us access so that's kind of how it works is we just know where the hit was at and then we have to contact that person or that police department. Um, but we don't have control over their system or their users. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think it got me a little cloudy. I'm sorry. Okay, so, sorry. So let's go back to your example with Toledo. Okay. So if Toledo called us, then they already have permission to access the information. They know if Toledo calls us, from my understanding of what I learned on Wednesday, if Toledo calls us, it's because the system told them that we have activity of uh -huh. something they're looking for. So they're calling us to find out what the activity is. So they would want But they already have permission to do. But we would have to grant the permission. I see. They're told by the system, hey, this car or this missing person or whatever okay. it is, was there's a hit in Jackson. Gotcha. So then what would be our reason to not give the information? We wouldn't have one. if we. I mean, if we want to be helpful, if they're looking for a missing yeah. person okay. or a stolen car or a kidnapped victim or, you know, I, I can't think of a reason we wouldn't want to help another law enforcement agency. So with, with that being said, then, if I'm understanding correctly, I think that stronger language in this would apply because if they're going to, if Toledo calls, and, we, and we've checked all the boxes, we're good, we can give them the information, they can, they can render it, then I see no need why we can't have stronger language here. Okay, we can do that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, nothing further. Darius, oh. do you think an email is sufficient to, it would protect I both people. You yeah. send me a written request, ding, 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 there it is. Now we got a paper trail, and requests from outside agencies could be put in a special file. Yeah, I agree. It, it shows a paper trail. It has, it has it, um, clearance on both sides so, in that regard. So, so if I may, gentlemen, because I went through this with the sheriff already last week. There is a trail. There is a computer trail that shows what agency accessed it, what officer did. Okay. And that's going to be part of the audit process, whoever we designate at the uh, administrator's office, which I believe the only two people with lean access are Deborah and Mike. Am I correct? Yeah. Um. Go ahead, Commissioner Baer, and then I was just going to make one point after that. Thank you, Committee Chair. Um, police departments, law enforcement operations, fire departments, they have uh, joint support agreements between them. So if one fire department needs help, they already have an agreement that the other department can come help them. Same thing with law enforcement. So we do have these joint support agreements um, so my question is about that about those agreements do any of our current law enforcement uh, joint support agreements with other agencies do they provide pre authorization to get into our flock camera system or do those existing joint support agreements mandate that they still call us, ask us, provide something in writing? Which, which way are those joint agreements set up? So typically your mutual aid agreements, in my experience, are with your neighboring communities. So we might have a mutual aid agreement with Calhoun County to assist in the event of a large scale emergency and vice versa, they would have one with us to assist in a large scale emergency. So the mutual aid agreements are typically with your neighboring communities in my experience, we wouldn't have one with Ohio, or we wouldn't have one with Mackinac, or we wouldn't have one with Traverse City, because they're too far away to come help. And so in the event of a large scale emergency. So those mutual aid agreements are restricted generally to your neighboring communities to help out in a large scale emergency. Um, the, the rest of your question, I don't know the answer to. 
Um, Maybe from the outer energy before mm -hmm. the boiling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Oh, Steve has help. <clears throat> It has been my experience when working with the sheriff on what you're referring to as mutual aid agreements. They don't even exist between a township police department and Jackson County sheriffs unless the sheriff deems them appropriate. And then he swears those police officers in as deputized county sheriffs also. So technically, if the city left this left the boundaries of the city and went to Spring Arbor to arrest somebody, they do not have the authority because the sheriff would not have, have deputized those officers. So in order to have what you're referring to under law enforcement, that would require the sheriff to deputize those other counties. You can't, you can't have a mutual aid agreement similar to what you're referring to. You actually, under Michigan, the Michigan Constitution, your sheriff has to deputize them. So um, in the past, I know Dan Hines, uh, I can remember three very specific cases where he did not deputize because he felt those people were not good law enforcement people. So it is up to the sheriff to who he chooses to deputize within his county. And you can deny it to local police officers. So that would be a, an individual case, I'm sure, with our sheriff and other, other counties. Commissioner Walls. Thank you. Um, Deborah. I'm going to ask you this, and you might not be able to answer. But one of the things I was thinking about with the person who makes a mistake so we all know that there um, is the possibility that the same person would make multiple mistakes over a course of time. However, is there the possibility of some sort of language, or perhaps it's already in the bargaining language, that would say, offense one, you're going to get written up. Offense two, you're going to um, have suspension. And offense three, you're terminated. So I'm not sure if there's some sort of a thing that we can put in that the officer who makes a mistake gets remediated one, two, or one or two times and then is terminated. I'm not sure if that's a possibility or if it already exists in the bargaining contract. Yes, generally that progressive discipline language is in the um, collective bargaining agreement. Um, so that's why we refer to that because there is progressive discipline and that's generally how you do it you do um, discipline is progressive discipline unless there's an extreme or an egregious situation um, where the person can't be you know an employee any longer so if there's an egregious situation where termination is um, appropriate um, that that the language is in the collective bargaining agreement to skip the progressive discipline. But forgetting to get something in writing isn't generally egregious enough to, to do so unless it's their 10th time doing it, correct? Okay, my, my next piece of that is, is there a way to put in there to atone to that policy that they have to have remediation or retraining each time they commit the offense? Yes, we can do that. Okay. So where did we end up on the language? Well, hold on a sec. We aren't anywhere on any language yet. We have to make motions and what and whatnot. But I want to bring everyone's attention to 419.89, releasing ALPR data. Particularly the underlying sentence for agencies without a mutual aid agreement, a letter of understanding or other agreement in place, a written request from the requesting law enforcement agency shall include the name of the agency, the name of the person requesting, and the intended purpose for obtaining the information. Through talking to the sheriff last week, there are agreements in place going back to what Commissioner Bearer had asked, mainly amongst the local law enforcement municipalities because in some instances, particularly with stolen cars, they got to act fast. And tracking somebody down to get a signed written portion is problematic. 
I think the majority of concern on this board and, and from the public is federal agencies, state agencies having overreach. And my concern with this language is if, if one of those agencies were to come into an agreement, I'd want to know about it. Personally, I, I, don't, I don't want the FBI having access to it unless there's a very good reason. Um, so that's not in that language. The way I'm reading that is, now I all due respect to Chairman Shotwell about the deputization. I didn't hear the sheriff speak to that uh, last Tuesday. But um, the way I read this is, that's open-ended, and one of those agencies could come to an agreement with the sheriff's department and have access um, on an ongoing basis. The, the deputy sat with a computer in their car, and uh, I just don't see a problem Say I need to access Flox, and then you got, a, you got a request and a response, both in email. Well, it's only and, one and person. Put it in a file. There's only a couple people that have the authority to do that. But you got to remember that. It's not every officer on duty. I wouldn't think we'd use these a whole lot. We were not We were told they wouldn't be. For the, the flock cameras, they do use for investigative purposes. Mm -hmm. So if they're looking for a white Honda, you know, they, you know, they, there's a search component where they can use it for detective work. Um, so there is a search component in it where you don't have to have a license plate, you can, you know, ser search for a particular type of vehicle um, to put somebody at the crime scene or something like that. So that's what I've, I was told. Um, so as, we will just hit on any white Honda? Well, dep I think it depends on what you put in. If you know the type of the vehicle or you know... Um, that's what I'm trying to stop, is anybody the white Honda will get pulled over today. So I was told they use it for detective purposes, for solving cases, to do investigative research. Um, that's what I was told that they use it for. And I still say we have a constitutional right not to be tracked just because. And uh, that, that to me isn't a very good, very good reason to lose my constitutional rights. Corey, reflecting on what you had indicated, that language I pulled from another policy because if you recall when the sheriff was here at study session, he talked about the mutual aid agreements that he does have with other communities yep. and that language satisfied the mutual aid agreement. It would be unusual to have that type of agreement, I think, we'd have to clarify with the sheriff, it would be unusual to have that blanket agreement with the state and especially the federal government. I, and I remember him speaking of that. I remember him not having an issue with even including that um, those agencies would not have that. First off, Gary. Run that by him. But first off, the sheriff said he's already turned down the FBI request for information before. I'm not sure. Stand right at the podium. Commissioner Bear. Thank you. That same paragraph, Corey, you were talking about 419.9 .9 related data. The last sentences, sentence in that paragraph, approved requests for data shall be, I'm sorry, requests for ALPR data for non-law enforcement and non-prosecutorial -prosecu agencies will be processed in accordance with records release policies and Freedom of Information Act. Can I get a copy of what are those records release policies? And uh, I guess what I'm looking for here is just, does someone just wanna know where my vehicle passed uh, an intersection? Um, they're just an individual. They want, they're snoopy about me. I mean, what is the release policy? Can, can you give us a copy of that so we can review it? I don't have a copy of any records release policy, but generally it's FOIA. If we are in possession of a document um, and somebody does a FOIA to request it, then we have to comply with the FOIA releases and, um, and release that document. Now the kicker is, don't be confused here, with how this system works. We are only in possession of a document if we download it for a case purpose. So if they download a document and it's attached to a case file, 
it now becomes eligible for FOIA. But as you recall, the data is being stored on a third party server. So it's not our information until we actually download it and attach it to a case file. And then it's subject to FOIA. So if I call the flock system and with them file a FOIA request, um, flock has the information. So can I write a Freedom of Information Act request directly to flock asking where has your car been for the last 30 days? They're a private, en they're government, a private entity. Government agencies are the only agencies that comply with FOIA. They're a private third-party company and they're not subject to FOIA. Good, thank you. All right, so we've gone all over the place today with the committee. You know, we've got a multitude of options. We could forward this to the full board as is. We could forward it with suggested amendments. We could ask administration to take into consideration the suggestions and bring forth a alternative document or any other ideas that you committee members may have. Commissioner Duckham. I would uh, support and make it a motion, if I may, that we send it back to administration, have them bring it forth next Tuesday uh, with some of these recommendations, and we can settle it next Tuesday. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there support? Supported by, motion by Duckham, supported by Williams. Is there any discussion? Just, I was gonna say, just confirming sending back to administration of the proposed policy for the sheriff's office for requested edits, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Bring back Tuesday. That satisfy what you wanted to know, Commissioner Bear? If I heard, the, heard it correctly, the motion is sending this back to administration for incorporation of certain comments. What, which comments? Which comments? I mean, do you want to be sp specific? Or, or how does the administration have an understanding of what we are asking with this motion? Well, I would, I, she, I would say, I will let her speak for herself, actually. She said, yeah. Because I'm sitting right here and I took notes. <laughs> That's how I know. For number seven, the language after number seven, um, under prohibited uses, and then the language of remediation for progressive discipline. Um, those are the two primary ones that I'm looking at. I would also like my concern about federal and state agencies not having the uh, ongoing agreement without being able to bypass the uh, written approval. All right. Once would it be appropriate to have all neighboring counties have reciprocating agreement? I mean, if somebody calls from Toledo, that's pretty uh, innocuous to me. We, we can't get uh, reciprocating agreements from every no. sheriff department in the country. No, sure can't. And they wouldn't. So, Commissioner Bear. Oh, Deborah, if I heard you correctly, you had mentioned paragraph 419. Point six, seventh item, uh, item seven under that. Part of that question also related to the unnumbered paragraph below paragraph seven. So is it your understanding that you would also be looking at that unnumbered paragraph? You didn't mention that specifically. Yeah, it's unnumbered for a reason. It further explains under prohibited uses the first paragraph that's not numbered. So it further explains it's not it's not numbered for a reason. It's further clarification of the prohibited uses. It's not a bullet yes. point. But my question is, yeah. when you were stating what you thought you needed to look at based on board members' requests, I didn't I don't recollect you saying that you're also going to look at that unnumbered paragraph. That's the paragraph, I said after number seven. Thank you. And that's, yeah, that's the paragraph after number seven. Yep. 
Committee members, any more discussion before we vote? We have a motion and support on the floor. Commissioner Duckham. I'll just say that, you know, I lost my constitutional battle with the flux cameras. I, I definitely want controls in there. So, yes, I'll be supporting this. Okay. I would call for a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Walls. Yes. Commissioner Duckham. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Commissioner Baer. Yes. Chairman Kennedy. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you, committee Chair members. Kennedy. Also, I'd like to uh, thank Mrs. Kabitsky because she's put a lot of work into this and there's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of research involved. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for all the time and effort you put in on it. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, one second, Commissioner Baer was for you and we'll come back to you. Relative to that unnumbered paragraph we've discussed, uh, the list may subject to criminal prosecution. Not every commissioner agrees that that word may should be changed to shall. So you were responding to input from commissioners. Uh, I didn't comment and say the word may works for me. Thank you, Commissioner Baer. Commissioner, Duck, we've passed this motion, so we really need to move on, and we can do commissioner comments. I'd just like to thank the, the board for a civil discussion on this, and that's how it's supposed to work. Thank you. All right, thank you. Takes us to item 5A. We'll be looking for a motion to pay the bills. Moved Move by Duckham, supported by Williams. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, passes unanimously. Takes us to item B, other minutes, of which I see none. Takes us to item C. Reporting schedule for May. We'll have the Jackson County Department of Transportation quarter one report, the 911 quarterly report, and the public defender quarterly report. Takes us to item six, public comment, second opportunity for public comment. I don't think I see anyone out there, unless you would like to make a comment, sir. All right, public comment is now closed takes us to item number seven, committee member comments. Are there any committee member comments? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I'd just like to uh, echo the same uh, message. Thank you, uh, Deb, for all your work in this regard. And also to all our, our fellow commissioners, this has um, uh, been a long process um, and a lot of communication, a lot of back and forth, but I just appreciate um, the effort that went into this, the conversation that went into this to help to ensure um, the safety of, of such projects. So just thank you everyone for your great work. Nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. I'd like to thank the uh, committee today. I agree with Commissioner Duckham, Commissioner Williams. Everyone conducted themselves well, made valid points, and I'm glad we're moving in a positive direction on this. With that being said, meeting adjourned.